Hello and welcome to episode 88 of the Page One podcast, the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. We do have a great back catalogue of guests there. Even this season we've had people like Alan Johnson and Stuart Turton and going further back people like David Nichols, Alex Garland, Sarah Pimbra. So do have a look at the back catalogue if you haven't checked it out already because there's bound to be someone that you're interested in. Uh, I'm Marco, and regular listeners will be expecting to hear Tarek, but uh, he couldn't make it for this recording of the uh, intro to the podcast, so uh, you just have to listen to me just now. But he is in the main episode of the podcast, which we'll get to very shortly, because it is a great guest this week. We're speaking with uh, science fiction and speculative fiction writer Blake Crouch, who's the best-selling novelist and screenwriter, perhaps best known for uh, the Wayward Pines series, which was turned into a TV show a few years back with Matt Dillon starring in it. Um, But more recently, his novels Dark Matter and Recursion have really hit the big time, I suppose. He, He talks about it in the podcast, about having two sort of breakthroughs in his career. The first was Wayward Pines, uh, when he decided, along with another writer, Marcus Seke, that they weren't going to do a small idea for a novel, for their next novel. They're going to do a big idea. And he really grasped that idea and turned that into a success. But Dark Matter and Recursion, again, he says, is a sort of another stepping stone in his career, which has seen him become a best-selling author as well. So it's really fun and interesting chat that we have with Blake. Uh, I will give one spoiler warning that if you don't know anything about the Wayward Pines series, um, there is some mild spoilers about uh, something that happens in the, I think it's the middle of the first book or towards the end of the first book. Um, Very, very mild spoiler, but uh, just in case you're desperate to read that without any spoilers at all. Although, as Blake says, the book did come out 10 years ago, so we thought it was safe territory to discuss. Um, So we'll get straight into the podcast after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, and then I'll be back briefly at the end of the podcast just to let you know about next week's guest. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read, or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise It's not just the story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be an author? Yeah, uh, I think so. I mean, I, my first uh, stories were scary bedtime stories to my little brother when he was four or five and I was probably 10 or 11. There's a six-year difference between us. 
and they would get more and more involved and they would become almost serialized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was that thing of telling him a really scary story and he didn't want me to keep telling him, but he also really wanted to hear what was going to happen next. And I just love that interaction with, uh, that, that you get as a storyteller when you get that feedback from the audience. Um, I don't know, it, it sort of set me down this path. Um, and then I, I mean, I was writing Twin Peaks fan fiction when they uh, canceled season two back in the nineties, <laughs> I wrote, um, a uh, Star Wars novel that was supposed to be set 30 years after Jedi. And I would write it whenever I got grounded in uh, <laughs> middle school and early high school. I'd go off and like, all right, I'm grounded. I'll just work on this. Um, by the way, the idea holds up. <laughs> when I look at what's happened. I was going last, to say it's uh, probably, probably better years. than the, what, oh, what they yeah. came out with. So. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm right in saying that you, you the, obviously that that love of uh, sort of writing and and storytelling it led you to study English and creative writing at college. Is that right? It did. Although, so I wrote. Um, I started writing short fiction, um, or horror short fiction, in middle school, and I went through a really like bad poetry phase in high school. I was involved with girls. You know, that that, pull, that <laughs> often pulls out some pretty embarrassing <laughs> shit. Uh, and then I started writing a my first novel my senior year of high school. It would not ever be published. Um, I didn't really, at that point, like I was enjoying writing and I wanted to be published. I don't think at that point I thought that, oh, this is what I'm going to do as a career. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I was going to be an English professor. And then I realized, oof, that's not fun. Um, and then I was going to go to law school for a hot second. And then it became clear to me, I was like, this is actually what I want to do. Um, and I want to do it for a living, which is hard because, you know, making a living, doing any kind of art is yeah, problematic. It's tough. So, so what was, I, th I think your, your first published book was Desert Places in 2004. That's right. How, how did that come about? Was that? A quick success story, or was it a case of, of mm. sending to law? I mean, com there, yeah, it, honestly, yes, it was a quick success story from the standpoint of I was pretty young when it happened. But no, I did query many, 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 many literary agents. I ended up pasting the rejection letters because back in the late 90s, early 2000s, they actually would send off a uh, stamped addressed self envelope, yeah. self addressed stamped envelope, and, and they would send back their letters to you. It wasn't the email thing. So I would start pasting them up on the walls in my <laughs> bedroom and I literally had covered one entire wall. I was like, this is not going well. Um, <laughs> but then I got a, I got an agent and she, uh, I had gotten her interest on my first novel, but she was like, this isn't quite ready yet. So then I wrote desert places during my college years. I did an independent study with a great professor of mine in the creative writing department. We edited the book for a, independent study and then i sold it i think the first year out of school nice and for for folk out there who are <clears throat> going through that same kind of process now trying to find an agent what what tips have you got you know what was it, it just a case of just keep at it you know i don't, I don't know anymore i, I mean <laughs> I, i'm sure it's very different now than it used to be um i think i heard dennis lahane say something when I was at a, uh, a reading he was doing for Shutter Island back in 2003 and, he, and someone had asked him this and he's, he said, you know, I just wrote this thing on my, uh, a sticky on my laptop and it's just, just, no one cares. And that is really, really true. No one cares. You have to like make them care. You have to mm -hmm. write something that's yeah. so undeniable that it snaps them out of, um, you know, all of the garbage that they're being inundated with and co with constantly and, and and make them see something and that's very very hard to do i mean great stuff i th i do think that great stuff eventually finds a home I, I truly believe that i don't think there's not a conspiracy out there to stop great storytelling to you know from uh getting to the market i just think people have to have expectations like if you're writing a super niche you know hard-boiled noir thing it might be the most genius thing in the world, but like, that's a tough sell right now. Um, you know, you've got to, you got to find how, how you break through the wall of all of this um, apathy out there, but good stuff. Does find I mean, uh, yeah. I, I think obviously 
if if the writing's good and the story's good, then I agree. Probably ultimately it will sell. But I think I suppose the the difficulty is, especially if you're starting out, is that you do have to kind of accept that you are going to get a wall full of rejection later. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, you, you have to mean so, rejections, to, mean yeah. rejections yeah. too. So there's <laughs> there's this guy, um, I think he's dead now, who worked or was the publisher for a place called Fjord Press, and I didn't realize this at the time. He went on to become the guy who um, translated Girl with the Dragon Tattoo books to oh, right. into the into English. Um, anyway, I sent him my very first novel, which was pretentiously called Down from the Sleeping Trees, and it was 210,000 <laughs> words, single spaced. <laughs> and his, he just scribbled in red ink on my query letter, too fucking long. <laughs> I, you might want to vary your expletives a tad. Um, yeah, you're going to get that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I, I read an interview with you. And you talked about your writing style, and 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 I, I wonder if you've taken that on board. Then, could you talk about how you have a lot of white space now in your mm-hmm. books, a lot of sparse, you know, keep it simple, tell the reader as little as possible. And is that a style that you kind of consciously strive for, or is it something you kind of came yeah, out naturally? It's an interesting question. Um, It's definitely a style that I started gravitating more towards, I would say, um, after my first couple of novels were published. You know, I think there's a tendency when you're starting out, like you want to just like throw it all out there and write the most beautiful things possible. I I think like the most beautiful thing is white space. Um, I I have such a hard time, especially with fiction these days. I find so much of it is so overwritten. Like nothing, like the actual amount of plot that happens in a lot of books that I read, like you, it's not enough for a book, but we're, it's like we've kind of veered into this place in contemporary commercial writing where it's all about, you know, we're living in the character's head and we're having to be exposed to like so much of their thoughts. And I, that, that, that's a big thing in YA, young adult <clears throat> fiction, which I think actually makes sense. That is the point of young adult fiction is either putting you know the audience inside that character's head and letting them ramble and think you know ad nauseum through every little thing they're doing I just hate that I I want like a ton of stuff to happen in my books and it's not that I don't want that interior reflection but when I when I do like come in on it I want it to be I want it to be devastating and I want it to be um additive to the plot not just taking up space i just feel like lately so much is just about taking up space taking up space and the hardest thing is actually to come up with a story um, that is endlessly surprising and inevitable and i think i don't know i just see a tendency towards putting that aside and just living with characters and in overriding and and it's something i've noticed in the late you know first decade of the 2000s and I made a shift and and writing short fiction kind of helped me do it because I was able to start experimenting with this style and and I and I just found a lot of energy from it I found you know it's like I don't know if I would call it minimalism um I would call it I don't know I would call it respecting the reader's time I want the pages to fly yeah and I think I think your books definitely do that and I think and it, it it goes back to that sort of um, that writing adage, which is normally applied to screenplays. I think, which is you know show don't tell kind of a thing. And I th- I think your books are very fast paced, and you do get a sense of the characters a lot. But um, like you say, you're never you're never like just rumin you're never in a character's head just ruminating with them and seeing what's happening. Um, so which I think helps with the pacing of the story as well, obviously. Um, and with your books, are you are you someone that that likes to outline a lot, or are you a bit of a pantser, as they say? Um, what what's your approach in that sense? I mean, I definitely outline. They just don't normally take. <laughs> um, I, what I, so what I'll do is if I have a gen, a very general idea, like I mean, just impressions of ideas. I have journals, and I'll start taking notes on on ideas and just like scribbling down I character thoughts character sketches plot notions honestly just atmosphere like mm-hmm. 
it's like I, Stephen King once said, like it, writing is kind of about unearthing a fossil that already exists. And I do think that it, there's a lot of truth to that. Like there's a, the book sort of is out there already. And, and I just have to sort of figure out what, where it is and see if I can see the, the outline of it. Um, and once I've been, you know, taking notes and journaling for a handful of months, if I, if I am feeling it, then I'll kind of switch over and I'll start building an outline. Uh, and, and, and it's one of the things that I think is, <clears throat> is actually great about the screenwriting business is it, is it actually taught me how to plot books because they don't, a lot, you know, writer, novelists think about story very, very differently than screenwriters think about story. Uh, I mean, they're both doing the same thing, but I think novelists are naturally more pantsers, as they say. Um, they may not know, I, and I didn't know it for years, they may not know that they're actually following this structure that has been around since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. but they're sort of following it and rambling around and and in that rambling, they actually, it feels fresh because you're not married to this. Oh, I've got to hit this beat, this beat, this beat, this beat. And when I started, like, there's a wonderful book. I'm, I'm sure you all have heard of it or maybe read it called uh, Save the Cat by yeah. Blake Snyder. And that was, a, that was a big deal when I read that book because I was like, oh, I, it's all this stuff I've been sort of just flailing about in the darkness. There's actually a very thoughtful structure behind it. And when you understand the structure, you can start breaking it down or, Kind of calling your shots a little more. Um, so I, 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 once I have the outline, I just want, I want to get it to like the halfway point of the book. And if I can get a, a decent outline to the halfway point, then I can start writing. I almost never. I mean, I don't. I don't think I've ever known what the end to one of my books is when I've started writing it. And that's not. I wish I knew the end. I mean, believe me, I wish I knew the end. <laughs> I'm always. I have rewritten the third act of my last three books like literally just toss the pages away and rewritten the third act because I don't, what I think it is when I'm writing the outline, you kind of hold on to that because, you know, this is what you've said you're yeah. going to do. And it's hard to like actually realize and admit to yourself, that's not going to work. You have to come up with something different and, and better. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and that, that's quite surprising though, because your books, you know, there are there are there are books that that you read that are you know very engrossing and get you there but the ending can be a bit of a damp squid but i think your books are very rounded and do have a good climax so it's interesting that you don't have that in your head mm -hmm. when you sit down to start writing is that always the case unfortunately tragically yes <laughs> um i and i don't know why i think it has to do with from because books really like my books I, I what I think I, I've realized lately is that um it really isn't about necessarily knowing what the plot is like what that runny jumpy shooty shit is at the, in the third act it's really about understanding where thematically mm -hmm. the book is landing um and if it's not if, the, if if you're not like landing thematically in that space that you need to be landing in then no, nothing you do in the third act is going to work because it, it's going to feel like a, uh, a lie. So what I've, what I've just kind of given myself permission to do is like, if, if this isn't working, I am going to throw it away and redo it. Because I found out, I, you know, I was a very unsuccessful novelist for a long, long time and wrote a lot of books. And I just realized like, it is so much more valuable to publish one like, great book than 25 good books like that one great book changes your life it changes your career it allows you if you want it to have time to figure out the books and write your next book properly and um, and so I just gave myself that permission like I'm going to if it takes me three years between books I'm going to take that time because it is far more impactful for me to write something that is mic drop than it is for me to write something that's just really good was that so? It was a conscious you. You were consciously doing that, were you, with with, with your well breakthrough? Yeah, and I would say I would say, yeah, and, I, and I, the book I would say was the breakthrough with that was Pines. Mm -hmm. um, I was, which is, which is the first book in the Weird Pines trilogy. I this was back in 2010, and I was on a on this. Uh, like so my, I'm a really good friends with the 
guy named Marcus Seiki. Do you know who that yeah, is? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So, Brilliant you know, when we, yeah. exactly. So when we start gearing up to write a new book often, and, and if we're lucky enough that we're both sort of in that inception moment at the same time, we'll try to get together. And so we did this in 2010 and we, we were at similar, he was actually much at a much higher place in his career than I was at that point, but we were both sort of writing what we kind of realized on this trip over drinks and stuff uh, was small books. And we just kind of made this pact um, uh, in this, uh, on this kind of backpacking trip, like no more small books, no more small ideas. Like, by the way, if we want to write a tiny idea, like in the future, that's fine. But like, let's, let's actually take a big swing at a very big idea. And I think the fear is like, oh, a big idea sounds stupid. And, you know, when I started thinking about pines, it's like, well, that's a crazy idea. That's dumb. And that's just like your fear of trying to, trying to keep yeah. you in your safe space. Um, but out of that trip, I wrote pines and we, I, we conceived pines and brilliance on that trip. And they were just big books for both of us because we hadn't really stepped out of the very grounded crime thriller sort of um, paradigm. And that was our first, that was our first foray out of it. And it was, I think, pretty life-changing for both of us. Is it, um, because I I did want to ask you about that. You've you've kind of, you know, moved over genres and you've merged genres together and you've got multiple genres in some books and, you know, you you feel like you're a difficult author to pigeonhole into a category and which I really like and that's something that we've chatted to folk in the past and they've said they've struggled with because the publishers always said no you're a crime author keep writing crime books you know how did how did, was it a difficult sell when you went with pines and it was a bit of a change or was it was it okay yeah I mean I, I, at that point in my career I was like you know I was at the bottom I was yeah. I'd bottomed out I, I didn't have anyone telling me to write something else because no one wanted <laughs> anything else. Um, I, you know, I, I was basically self-publishing at this point. And I, and then, you know, I sold pines to one of Amazon's uh, thriller imprints. And, and this was back when Amazon's uh, publishing arm was powerful and, and doing new, interesting things in terms of marketing and rolling books out. Um, but no, it, it, I don't know that it was, I've, I've never, I mean, I've definitely, felt in my early years when I was publishing my first few books with St. Martin's that sort of stay in your lane thing. Mm. Um, but I never, I don't know. I've, I've, I just had never really done that. Um, I've always just written the book that I wanted to write. And it's just lately been about finding people who are going to empower me to do that. And, and luckily I have done that. I've, I've found that amazing group of people. And, and with, with Pines, I, I want to ask about that in particular about, the the idea of pines you know in your i think it's an afterword in the in the novel you talk about it being an homage to to twin peaks um and that was the kind of story that you were you were wanting to tell but did you have um i mean i'm gonna warning if you haven't read it i'll, sp- I'll spoil the story slightly here well, so. came out like 10 years ago yeah, so. exactly yeah. <laughs> everyone's had a chance like. exactly but uh, did you have that idea of uh, i'll i'll tell this story about a mysterious town but then i'll have this it'll turn out to be this massive time jump was that always yeah. part of the idea or was that something that you developed as you were writing like you were saying before yeah um so pines is it's really interesting i just had it's a good timing for the question because i'm publishing a new um it's because pines has never been was never released in hardcover in america all right okay. so we're doing a uh, a new edition of it that's this like really nice little box lettered set so i had to write through all of and go back and remember how this whole thing came together i had this um there's this town i go to near where i live in durango colorado called uray and it's actually the town that pines is based upon it is tiny 800 people live there it's surrounded by these mountain walls now there there's a road in one side of town you can go out the other so it's not like pines there's one road in one road out but it's fairly close to that and i was there um many many years ago uh on a just a holiday weekend and it's super quiet and i was walking out around dusk and i hear a phone ring from a house and because it's in this like quiet valley it just bounces off all the mountains and then i heard another phone ring and another phone ring and i just wondered what if they were calling each other to talk about me and what if every phone in every 
house in this town started ringing simultaneously. And all these people came out of their houses and started chasing me and I couldn't leave. And that was literally this, the germination of it. And then for like the next three years, and I had this whole sequence of events of, I came up with this idea of this agent who came to this town looking for his partner who had come here, but he'd gone missing. And I loved that. Um, and I had like a good, I would say half the mid, I had like 200 pages sort of outlined for all of this really interesting things that were happening. And, and I really loved the sequence of events. It felt new and fresh, but I had no idea why anyone was doing the things they were doing. I know why the townspeople wanted to kill him. I know why he <laughs> couldn't leave this town. I had no idea. Um, and I just spent a long, long time trying to whittle away at it. And this is one of the instances where I was smart enough to, to not start writing yet. Because yeah. I was like, I can't actually start writing this book until I figure out what it is. And then I remember one day I was just sitting around in my journal and, and um, you know, kind of beating my head against the wall. On it and I just had this idea. Oh, what if this is the last town on earth? What if there's nothing else out there? And then I started thinking, all right, how will that work? I started doing a little research into like flash evolution and suspended animation. And, and then the thing, all the pieces just started falling into place mm. and I wanted to write a um I, what I thought it was going to be was a graphic novel I really I, I kind of thought my novel career was toast at this point uh, and I started talking to a guy named Will Dennis at Vertigo which is DC and mm. and we started kind of developing the idea we we're going to do a maxi series and we just kind of even started sort of breaking down these um these episodes and at this point in time it was called psychosis um right. Brian Azzarello. Like, do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He actually suggested, why don't you call it Pines? I was like, genius. Um, and then he couldn't get the money to buy it. Uh, he couldn't get uh, he couldn't get his bosses to to take the risk. It was a, you know, it's it's new IP, it's uh, it's not based on pre-existing characters. Yeah. So then I was like, fuck it, let's just try to write this as a novel. Um, mm -hmm. but I had it all worked out at that point. And does the does the process of for of four pines and you know given that it had been in your head in some way for so long <clears> and also what you were saying earlier about outlining mm -hmm. at least the start of a novel once you actually sit down to actually do the writing is it is it quite a quick process when you actually get to that stage of it? No, it's not. It's a slow, terrible process. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, so for and I don't want to talk too much about it, but I'll talk about my process for the book. I'm yeah. uh, about to finish. Um, I had the idea of it. I've had the general idea of wanting to do something in this with this kind of science for a long time. And I would so two year, more than two years ago, I would say, la, yeah, about, uh, maybe two years ago, started writing it. And I wrote from September. To, I outlined did kind of what I just explained, and I and I outlined it, and I wrote seventy thousand words. Which, by the way, Pines is seventy thousand words. My mm -hmm. my novels these days come in around 90 and I was at the 70,000 word mark um, in the, in July of 2020. And I just realized I don't have it. I'm 70,000 words in. I, I don't, I don't even know if this is the midpoint. Um, there was a lot about it. I liked, but in terms of just that, the propulsive, like, this is what this book is about. I, I didn't know. So I put it aside and debated doing something either completely new or trying to reshape it. And I decided there was enough here and I'm, I just, I need to, I need to see this idea through. So I start, I blank paged it and then started writing in set la a year ago, a little over a year ago, the, a new draft of it. Same characters or some of the same characters, some of the same backstory, definitely the same kind of science, but a completely new way into it. And I finished it in June, sent it to my editor, we both agreed the third act was complete garbage throughout <laughs> 35,000 words of that. Um, and then I wrote, basically started, you know, then I started doing my edits for the first two thirds. And then in the last, in this August, I went away and I basically between August and now have written the new third act, which I'm polishing now. So that is honestly what my process looks like. It's just messy. It's a lot of starts and stops. Towards the most of it happens at the end, and the last few like layers of you know drafts six and seven is where I think <clears throat> the books really the book like really really starts 
to coalesce into something. Is that the bit? So are you someone, it sounds like you're someone then that enjoys the, the redrafting more than the initial story. No, I mean, I would honestly love to write it brilliantly the first time right, and move yeah. on with my life. Yeah, that's what yeah, I would love to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that just isn't the way it tends to go. Um, the characters just, you know, it's like there's a shallowness I would say to my first five drafts. It's like it's like the the general plot movements are mm-hmm. there. The characters are are still like sharpening into focus. The theme is still getting worked out. Um, the science is still getting uh, sorted. And yeah, it, I don't know. I, I, I would love to find a way down to have to, I would love this not to be my process, yeah, but I think, I, uh, but every, I don't know. It's like every book that, and that's, I think what's really, really hard about writing is every, every book is like, you sort of have to figure out how to write that book. It's not like mm-hmm. I can take what I did with dark matter and recursion and apply it to this. There, there are rules of course, but like each book has to, tell you how to write it um, at least yeah. that's my been my experience you know is that the same when you're writing uh, a, a new standalone as opposed to uh, a continuation of an existing mm. story like with the wayward pines mm-hmm. yeah i've only really written two like i would say series and that you know, like desert places locked doors my my first books were you know sequential and wayward pines um I mean, I think there's good, good and bad for both. I think like by the end of Weird Pines, I had been working on that series for five years. And um, I mean, I felt like I couldn't leave Wayward Pines. I, I was so ready to do something fresh and new. Um, so I think you're fighting against two things. You know, there it is, it is like the standalone, especially like science fiction standalone with, you know, characters that we give a shit about that. that those are, those. it's why my book's, it's three years between books. It, it just takes a lot of time to figure out the science, to figure out the characters, to figure you the way in, to figure out how what's the, like the equation to make all of this work and and move by seamlessly. Uh, it just takes time. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I I read. I know you just said that Pines was your kind of your breakout book, and I'm sure I read. I think it was an interview with you. I read online that you said Dark Matter. You kind of thought as your as your mm-hmm. breakout book, and and I did wonder what whether creatively dark... pine. Well, creatively Pines was I think because it was like all of the things like I'd written a book before that which I loved, which I think was the first step towards this, which is called Run, which is was a self published novel, a horror, a horror a speculative horror thriller novel which I still love but not but in very imperfect pines kind of came together in a lot of ways creatively and was successful but it was successful sort of on the amazon ecosystem Mm -hmm. dark matter was a major publisher in hardcover so it it just I, i think creatively all the everything came together and also commercially in terms of the book selling and and people finding it came together with dark matter so yeah uh, yes different la- levels of of breakout i would say or break what why do you think dark matter clicked with so many people because for me that is definitely i mean i knew you from pines but then dark matter that was the one that i was seeing everywhere you know that was on it was all the mm-hmm. social media and it, everyone was talking about it and in a much bigger way than i thought they ever had been about the pine stuff and why why do you think dark matter really clicked got through the zeitgeist a little bit mm. partly partly because I had a massive hardcover publisher behind it who got it out everywhere. But also I think I was, I was choosing to be, um, to re- sort of, I wasn't afraid to put more of myself and my fears and my thoughts and things into the main character and let that actually permeate the book. Or as, you know, there's some of that, you know, we can't help but put ourselves in our, neuroses and things and in everything Mm -hmm. we write whether we intend to or not that was the first time I was like I'm I'm not even gonna try to hide any of this stuff I just want to put everything I'm feeling at 35 36 years old into this thing and just leave it all on the field emotionally and 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 since you've had these uh, the success with Pines and and obviously Dark Matter and Recursion um, you've also moved into the field of writing 
screen for the screen as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. is that something you always wanted to do and how, how do you find the difference between the two processes mm -hmm. yeah i mean i started one you know back in desert places i was trying to adapt it <laughs> right um that's when i started messing around with the form and i always loved the form of of the script when a script works there's just nothing quite like it it just sails it's like the the screenwriter sort of has full control of how you are experiencing and they're turning your head and pointing you at this and pointing you at this and the better they the better the, the masters are at it the lighter the touch they do and the dialogue it, there's nothing like it when it when it works and i just was always drawn to it and i think my my writing style is um tends towards that sort of mm -hmm. minimalism yeah anyway and i like that you can't in 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 screenplays you can, i like that you can't cheat and just tell what characters are thinking you've got to you've got to earn it um so i when i made my wayward pines when i sold wayward pines to uh to fox i did it on the condition that they would let me write one script one of the episodes it was a 10 episode event series and they're like sure fine which is the easiest thing because most most writers get rewritten anyway they're like i'm sure it'll be garbage <laughs> and we'll just re rewrite it it's fine <laughs> So I got to do that and um, and write a few more scripts and and really kind of get my hands into that show um, with the with the, the guy who created it, my my good pal Chad Hodge, and I just learned so much from him. He's such an incredible screenwriter. And after we were Pines, we ended up like let's do this, let's keep doing this. So we uh, I, I said I think you'll like this character. It's very different from Weird Pines. It's this this woman named Letty. And uh, I wrote a bunch of short stories about her and some novellas, mm -hmm. what you think? And he really sparked to her. So we decided to create that show together. And we wrote that. Um, and it's just, I, I don't know why. I don't know why I love the form, but I think there's just something um, really magical about it. And I, and I think it's, a, it's part of my aesthetic of, of the, way that I, the way that I write. Now the downside about, and why my no, you know, writing novels is my day job, is like you can write a script and, it might get made. It might not. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it gets made, the script isn't the final. The, the script is the, the script's just an invitation for other people to come along and collaborate with you. It's it's rarely the, you know, mm. on, only film geeks are, are like at home reading these <laughs> yeah. scripts yeah. over and over. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you just don't ever have that final thing. When you finish a book, you have a book, and mm. it is, you know, it. it no word on that book is there unless I want it to be there and there's something really magic about that well I, I was going to ask do you, do you like the collaborative process of, of mm -hmm. screenwriting or you know is it I suppose is it is it nice to have the yeah. variety you want to keep both I alive, like the variety I yeah and the clap the collaboration is very nice when you're working with people who are smarter than you are which is what I always try to do is make sure I'm working with people who are smarter than I am um when you're not working with smart people, there's nothing more demoralizing. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it hard to adapt your own work into a script? You know, because you're obviously what works in a book is no what works in a script. The, is it not is it, or is for it me? It's not for me. That's and yeah. I mean, what's hard is because it and I've I've figured out so much by the time if I'm adapting it, and this is why I don't know that I would ever do something that wasn't an adaptation of my work because. There is like a, the process I just explained to you of like for this last book and recursion was a nightmare and dark matter was a nightmare. Um, it's you figure so much out in three years of a story yeah. and it's not a one to one adaptation, but your character arcs are figured out. You've got a bunch of great scenes and then it's just about, well, which scenes are we leaning into, which are not necessary because there is some economy that has to come into the film process. But I mean, I was like, why would I let someone else um, like, I didn't want to do like with recursion. I knew I didn't want to adapt that because that book like destroyed me in terms <laughs> of like broke my brain. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to hang out with this idea anymore. Um, but like dark matter, I'd figured it out. I was like, why would I let someone else come in and take the benefit of all of the years that I've spent figuring that story out. I know what the story is. And I think it comes down to like, you either know what the story is or you don't. If you know what the story is in terms of the adaptation, you should do it. If you don't know it, then let someone else who has that vision come in. And, and what's, what's 
the, what stages Dark Matter at in terms of the adaptation? Um, not a whole lot I can say about it because nothing has really been right. officially announced, but um, we are, uh, you know, we're writing scripts and uh, hoping to have some pretty cool announcements shortly. Excellent. Nice. And Recursion, you just mentioned there that you're not writing the mm-hmm. screenplay for that. And, and am I right in saying that's been adapted into a series and a movie? Is that, are they linked or is it, are they separate? I, you know, I don't know what they're in. I don't, I don't know what the final um, format of that's going to be. If it's going to be a film and then a show, or if it's just going to be straight TV series, um, you know, they're figuring it out. I'm not very, I'm not really in that process. They're, they're, they're writing it and uh, trying to get that going. So I'm, I'll find out when, uh, you know, there's real news, I guess, to be cool. There's, to you know, is it Shonda Rhimes and Matt Reeves doing it? Big names. That, it, is, know, that must be quite is. exciting to see, see big names like that get involved in loving your work so much and taking it forward. It's, it's really, it's really cool because, um, you know, they, they are both uh, have powerful uh, connections over at Netflix. And I, and I think it's just kind of the perfect place for, for recursion. It needs, it needs some out of the box thinking to yeah. um, to pull that book off. Yeah, I suppose that's the good thing about streaming services now is that they do take risks in ways that like network TV is never used to back in the day. Yeah. They do experimental stuff, and they know there's enough there's an audience that will watch it type of thing. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, and like I, I can I can make something. It doesn't have to be an art. Like you know, back in the day, it'd be like, well, it's either going to be a movie or it might be a premium cable thing. But there was there weren't a ton of outlets for premium cable yeah. or it will be a 22 episode uh, thing at, you know, on, on one of the networks. Yeah. It's really nice now is you can, you can adapt something or build something that's, you know, the right number of episodes to tell the story. You're not having to vamp. You're not having to uh, artificially cut it short. You know, it, it, you, yeah. it, it, it has that space to breathe. Yeah. We just started watching squid game. And it's completely bonkers. And bonkers. Um, it's nine episodes and it's just crazy. And I'm like, this isn't something I could ever imagine being made 10, it's, 15 isn't, years yeah. ago. I've seen the first two episodes. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. And not yeah. what I thought. They're taking so much time with the character, which is, it's weird with the way they showed the uh, the trailers on Netflix. It looked like, um, almost like Battle Royale. Remember yeah, that? That, I was uh, expecting much I, more like that. I yeah. was expecting that. And I not this thoughtful character piece about, all of these, you know, people in dire straits. It, it's really, it's been such a great surprise. Yeah. And uh, you, you've you've told us obviously that you're you've just f- finished the edits and stuff on, on the third book. I mean, do you take close, a, close, 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 close. <laughs> um, do, do you do you take a break uh, before you launch into your next book, or is that already mm. percolating in your in your mind? I, you know, I've just rarely had the um, when it comes. To like come knowing my next book while I'm still writing the, the one before it, I, I've never, I've never really had that. So mm. it'll, I would like to roll right into something new, and that's my intention. But I suspect I'll have to take a couple of months and and sort of dry out from this book and 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 kind of start my process. What are the, what's the thing that I subconsciously want to write that I have to figure out what that, and then I want to figure out what that is. Yeah. Would you go back to trying a graphic novel again? Um. I don't know. I, I don't know what, I don't think there are many comic book companies I would want to work with. Um, I mean, there are a few that are like creator owned, like image. Um, I, I think for the most part, it's a terribly predatory industry. Um, I watch, I, I watch MCU movies and, you know, the people who actually created the characters. Yeah. Like, fine. Don't pay them. Can you at least acknowledge they created this yeah, character? Absolutely. You can't yeah. even do that. I'm like, fuck you. I don't want to work. With, I don't want to work with. Um, yeah, we were chatting like with that. um, was it? I can't remember who we were chatting to the podcast earlier and we were about the Winter Soldier and how it was Ed Alex DeCamp talking about Ed Brubaker. Yeah. yeah, he basically found out it was they were making a movie version of it. You know, when the rest of the world found out. You know, and just the fact that he mm-hmm. was the guy who came up with this character and was instrumental in the whole. I mean, it's basically the whole story he came up with, and they just basically lifted yeah. it. But he didn't get. There's no credit. There's no recognition of no. that and it's a shame it's, it's a real feeling i think it's you know the comic book writers need a strong union they need you know uh, until people stop doing business with these companies yeah and refuse to give them new content like nothing's going to change these no, no one change does anything without a gun to their head like they just won't so unless they 
decide to make it hurt, you know, I don't think anything's going to change. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I see actually quite a lot of the, the bigger ones are now, Substack seems to be the big thing at the moment and they're all yeah. taking their creator own stuff over there. So it'll be interesting to see if that, if that does cause. Yeah, the there, was quite a, there was quite an exodus away from Marvel yeah. a few years ago. A lot of the big names mm-hmm. were obviously like, you know what, screw this. We can make yeah. as much money doing our own stuff and have a complete kind of creative control. And oh, which I totally honestly, get. if, if I had ended up doing Wayward Pines as a graphic novel at DC, it probably would have, I, I don't know that a show ever would have been made of it. Like it, it honestly, it's one of those things where you think something, you know, it didn't work out and I was devastated yeah. at the time, but you actually don't know, like it's a good Cormac McCarthy quote. You don't know what worse luck your bad luck saved you from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Yeah. What was the last book that you read? What was the last book that I read? Um, I usually have like five things kind of going at once. Um, I just finished a little while ago, Project Hail Mary by uh, oh, yeah. Andy Weir. And yeah. Extraordinary. Have you guys read it? Yeah, I listened to the audio book version of it. It was excellent. What, what you, oh, it's fantastic. It was, yeah. um, I liked it more than The Martian. I loved the, uh, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know. Yeah, I've not read it yet. Yeah, no, when you, uh, yeah. Wait, wait till you meet Rocky. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought um, the <clears throat> Artemis, I wasn't massively keen on Artemis, but I thought this was like a right back up mm-hmm. there for me. I, yeah. I, I really loved it, yeah. Um, actually, since that, I, the one I most recently, that on the fiction, on nonfiction, I recently finished a book called The Sixth Extinction, um, which is the, exactly what it sounds like. It's heartbreaking, but it's just about the actual uh, extinction event we're going through right now yeah absolutely <laughs> we're gonna lose a million species we're gonna lose a million species because you know human humans suck <laughs> yeah <laughs> as they prove every day sadly but yeah. exactly um what about the last film that you watched hmm. i took my kids uh to see venom 2 uh nice is it good yeah it's a lot of fun it's a blast yeah. Yeah. yeah, I quite I quite enjoyed enjoyed the first one and that kind of it felt very much like a, a, a comic book movie from the, like the nineties, like a really kind of yeah. Old it's, there's a there's a goofy quirkiness to it that they just lean into that there, there's just nothing else quite like it in um you know all of the MCU stuff, which is I mean very well done, it, it, but it's like serious and yeah, yeah yeah. There's just a playfulness to it that's just. And it's a bonkers idea. It is an actually bonkers idea. And I can't, I can't believe they made it, but it just shows you like people will show up for, for weird stuff, you know? Yeah. That's cool. I'm, I'll definitely watch that at some point. Yeah. And uh, what was the last TV show that you watched or are watching? Um, oh, I just, what we just, uh, my wife and I just started a new thing last night, which was, and we were really happy with it. It's on Hulu. It's called, only murders in the building. Oh, Steve, Steve Martin, Steve Martin, Martin Selena Gomez, yeah. and Martin Short. It's it, it's a it is a like flawless pilot. Brilliant. No, I've seen I, that. I really want to watch that. Yeah, is that, I don't even is it a comedy or is it uh, more of a series? Yeah, it's yeah. No, I mean it's it it has sort of a um, the tone of it is really interesting. It's like it has a caperish kind of tone, mm-hmm. but it's also really it has some like really heartbreaking moments as well. Martin Short is wonderful in it um and it also has you know it's about these three characters that live in this uh upper west side apartment and somebody gets killed and you're not exactly sure all the what's going to develop but it just has such a nice atmosphere to it excellent no definitely gonna watch that and uh, the very final final thing we always do is a super quick fire either or and um Mm -hmm. i always say there's no right answers apart from one but the first one is uh michael Crichton or andy weir oh you're uh Making me choose between some really <laughs> hard things here. Oh, Andy Weir. Cool, fair enough. Uh, Twin Peaks or the X Files? Come on. <laughs> Twin Peaks, okay. Thanks. Twin Peaks. Uh, TV or cinema? Hmm. When you say cinema, do you mean like capital C cinema, like, or do you just mean film? Oh, no. I mean, uh, what do you mean by capital C cinema? I mean, like, um, one character's journey into the, you know, that kind of shit. 
or do you mean like all? Oh, no, movies? just like do all movies, like yeah. in a in a in a in a theater, yeah. you know, with that no uh, one's on the phone, TV. darkness. Oh, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> a night owl or early bird? Night owl. Uh, eat in or go out? Go out. And real book or ebook? Real book. Unfortunately, that was the. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much to Blake for coming on to the podcast. I really enjoyed chatting with him and I know Tarek did as well. So uh, I hope that you enjoyed listening to him. Uh, one thing that he mentioned there, which I would be intrigued to see, is his idea for a Star Wars novel or film. I think his take on something like that would be really interesting. Uh, so hopefully that could get developed in some way. That would be brilliant. But thanks again to Blake for coming on. Uh, you can pick up his books, obviously, in any of your friendly local bookshops uh, or online. And we'll put a link to uh, a place where you can get his books in the podcast description. Next week, we've got another great guest in the form of Dominic Nolan, the crime writer whose uh, previous books, Past Life and After Dark, star his detective with amnesia, uh, Abigail Boone, and received rave reviews. Uh, And his latest book, Vine Street, is uh, just coming out uh, and has already been getting great reviews in the press, being talked about as a book of the year. It's set in the 1930s Soho and blends caustic wit rich characterization uh, with an emotional punch. Uh, um, it was really interesting speaking to Dominic about how he planned and researched something like that because uh, there's a lot of realism to his novel that he's had to bring in there while casting a fictional story around it. Before we go, uh, as always, if you enjoyed the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a couple of seconds to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast app. That really helps us uh, stay in the charts. And uh, if you want to get in touch, you can tweet us at right underscore gear or email us at podcast at rightgear.co.uk. But otherwise, have a great week and we'll see you next episode. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. See you later.